Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to speak to you today. And I'm very happy to speak about the topic which is probably close to all uh, hearts of ours. Because me, myself, I am an immigrant here. So is my husband who found tremendous chances in America. And so are some of our Polish students uh, at IWP. Uh, the topic of my presentation is greed or exasperation, the reasons for the latest wave of Polish immigration. I got interested in this topic uh, last year, especially, when Polish presidential elections that resulted in the change of government in Poland and later parliamentary, pa parliamentary elections were widely commented in the media in the Western Europe and in America. And the main, um, and the main idea of the Western media was that uh, Poland has never been so rich, safe and free, to quote The Economist from <coughs> August 2015. And this struck me as interesting because so many of my friends have emigrated. Should Poland be this country of, um, let's say, the new El Dorado of Eastern Europe, would they do that? Why do they do that? I was trying to find reply to this question, uh, but wherever I looked in the press, the general idea was, yes, Poland is fabulous, economic situation is fabulous, and now we have this new populist government that may actually destroy it. So I was wondering, is there anything to destroy? Uh, and just to uh, finish up the idea of, of Poland being uh, in a fabulous condition, uh, it was mostly based on the fabulous performance of Poland under the economic crisis. Poland in contrary to all the other countries, didn't feel um, the blow of the crisis. We managed to have any economic growth under the recession, and it was approximately 2.56%. It was probably owned to the flexible behavior of the largest state-owned bank, who was acting uh, together with Polish government to mediate the, um, the blow. Uh, but some say that it might have been due to the large investment into the Polish economy in the years immediately preceding the crisis, and some said that it might have been due to the fact that Polish economy is quite insular, and as a result it was not that much connected to all the troubles uh, present in the global economy. So as I say, we have this um, overall idea that the economy in Poland is great and that this is a fabulous country and this idea was perpetuated by the press in the West. However, there are some phenomena that go unnoticed. And one of those phenomena which is largely unnoticed or possibly ignored is massive, massive in immigration of the youngest generation of Poles the youngest generation of productive Poles, that is the people who are starting to have families, people who are contributing to the pension system, which is in fact a Ponzi scheme, and this is how it works in Europe, uh, they are gone. Whatever they contribute to the Polish economy, they do, they do it by sending money to their families or by coming every now and then to Poland and spending money in Poland. But it's doubtful whether they will be able to contribute on a regular basis to our pension system. In fact, this is a time bomb that nobody is focusing on because polls are gone, there is no social pressure on the part of the young generation and the government, especially the previous government of Poland, was happy with that situation. So what happened in 2004 opened the gate for the Poles to be able to work abroad. We joined the European Union and three countries, UK, Ireland and Sweden, immediately opened their job markets to the Poles. Not surprisingly, there are large Polish minorities in those countries now. 
However, nobody expected the massivity of this phenomenon. In the UK, the government authorities uh, that were in power in 2004 estimated that 13,000 Polish people are going to come to work in the United Kingdom. As of now, the minority of Poles in the United Kingdom is the largest foreign minority that lives in the United Kingdom. It is 15% of their overall population of migrants and it is 680,000 people. In, uh, when we read the reports on immigration in Europe in the years 2000-2015, uh, Polish emigration uh, had <coughs> tremendous growth, very rapid growth at a rate of 5.1% per year. We are migrating at a rate that is only comparable to Syrian refugees, Romanians who, uh, who come from the similar economy because Romania is another big country uh, who has joined the European Union uh, in the years 2000, and, uh, and India. So since 2004, altogether 1.8 million Polish people left Poland in search of better jobs. This phenomenon of emigration is not new in the Polish culture, under the partitions and also during the communist rule, subsequent waves of immigrants were leaving Poland. But it was always in the conditions of, of some sort of repression. However, now there is no repression. All we had is the tra political transformation of our system that was followed by the economic transformation. So how come that we can find no interesting chance in our own country? Exporting and importing unemployment. Not surprisingly, uh, unemployment in Poland is inversely correlated with emigration. In 2003, before, we, uh, be before the year of accession to the European Union, Poland had unemployment as high as 19%, uh, which was overall result for the whole Poland. In certain regions, the unemployment was as high as 30 or 40 percent. This means every four people in ten have no job. It's, it's a tremendous uh, burden and it changes the attitude of the whole generation. It's, we, it, this effect was very interesting because as a result of economic changes uh, at, the, uh, at the break of the 1980s and the 1990s, many people were left destitute. Radical economic reforms led to the formation of the whole group that felt that they have no future. Everybody was uh, trumping the... Um, uh, trumpet, trumpet. Tru uh, sorry, trumpeting. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, everybody was trumpeting the, the great uh, achievement of Poland, the liberation of Poland, but nobody was really wondering if people have jobs. Can they have jobs? Are they going to be happy? And not surprisingly, in 2004, when the new opportunities uh, opened to all the people who were, as members of the European Union, allowed to work elsewhere, off they went. Within the years 2004-2007, two, uh, unemployment fell by 13%, and ever since, it hovers slightly below the level of the unemployment in the European Union. Our youth leaves to uh, take jobs that they can take. They are usually overqualified. Uh, higher education, people with higher education are mostly unemployed in Poland. So they face a choice. Either we do something below our level of qualification in Poland or we do that abroad. For many of them who are well educated, can speak English, can speak other languages, the choice is simple. We go either to Germany or to the UK. Ireland used to be a popular destination too. And what is interesting, Scandinavian countries. All the uh, voivodeships of Poland uh, in the northeast 
notice larger interest in learning languages such as Norwegian or Swedish because jobs in construction are available to Poles in those countries. What is more, a certain phenomenon which is even more worrying appears. Among Polish sociologists, it's, it's called the Dutch disease because um, the Netherlands used to be one of the popular work destinations for Poles from the eastern uh, border of our country. Namely, people live in a certain of limbo. The, re the seasonal work that they have in the Netherlands is enough for them to provide for the living for the remaining nine months. So they go for seasonal works, they come back to Poland, they consume what they've earned else elsewhere, and then when the year passes by, they go again. So there is never a situation for them that actually they are ready to start a regular job. And what is more, the job market is decreasing as a result because none of the employers want to take the risk of training employees who are going to go to seasonal work that is going to be better paid. So what is the reason for emigration? Are the young Poles so greedy that they would not stay in their own country and go for higher wages elsewhere? Or maybe it is exasperation. Maybe there are some reasons that push people to leave their home, leave their family, and as we all know, Polish people are tremendously family people. They enjoy being around uh, their, their own kin. They rarely switch cities. Poland is not like America, that people can grow up in California and work in Washington, D.C. Poland is much more stationary. So what prompts them to do that move? I was looking for answers in, in the field of economy because I thought there needs to be some reason, some rational reason. If everybody says that the situation of Poland is great and, and people don't see it and react as if it was not great, maybe it can be explained. And I decided to look into Economic Freedom of the World Index, which is an index prepared by Fraser Institute. And it is the index which is the most often used by various people who are trying to estimate the level of economic freedom in a given country. Uh, the index is composed of 42 variables and on the scale from 1 to 10, the result of 10 points is the best result. Why is economic freedom important? The economic freedom basically means better quality of life. Those countries that have higher, uh, uh, higher index offer better chances to their, uh, to their um, citizens, not only providing basic services that a state should provide, but also uh, providing the um, atmosphere conducive to uh, business activity. And top 20% of the free countries uh, are those who enjoy the highest income. So only though there is only 20% of countries that have uh, the results of the economic in in index close to 10, uh, they account uh, for the 20% of the most wealthy ones. And what is more, economic freedom uh, also uh, provides self-reported higher level of uh, happiness and it is also uh, good for war prevention. The index that I looked into is composed of five parts, size of government, legal structure and security of property rights, access to sound money, freedom to trade internationally, regulation of credit, labor and business. And even though our overall result is good, it has considerably improved from 104th place in the ranking in 1990 
of uh, 157 uh, countries investigated, uh, there are some phenomena that worry. Now Poland ranks as 47th out of 157 countries investigated with 7.29 points. The best countries who ho <coughs> uh, hover around the nine points. So we could say that 7.29 is not bad. And this is what is perpetuated by people who report on the situation in Poland. They say, well, the economy has not suffered as a result of the crisis. It is improving, the in infrastructure is improving. So this is the general outlook. But when you look into the details, only this, uh, I don't know how, okay, it is visible to everyone. Uh, only this group uh, of indicators, sound money, is really sound. As you can see, the result was improving from 2.50 in 1990 to 9.71 in 2014, which is almost maximum. But even in this group that enjoys high results, we have a worrying phenomenon, namely illicit financial flows. Uh, global, an NGO from Washington, Global Financial Integrity, prepared a report that was investigated illegal movement of money between the borders. Illegal money or illicit money as they called it is the money whose source is illegal or whose transfer is illegal or the aims to which it is devoted are illegal. So the illicit financial flows in Poland are quite considerable. They put us among top 20 countries in the world that have the largest illicit financial flow. I must say that I was surprised to discover that not, none other country of the European Union made it to this nebulous position. So our illicit cash outflow per year is $9 billion dollars on average in the period between two, uh, 2004 and 2013. So yes, we have sound money, economic freedom, but we also have this. Other indicators are more worrying. And here, when you look at the categories in which the situation is not changing or is deteriorating, we will f you will find the answer why young Poles prefer to leave their home country, to leave their families, to risk the orphanhood of their children, because the number of the so-called Euro orphans, that is children who suffer as a result of breakup of the family, is increasing. We have 100,000 of Euro orphans who are reported, that is out of the overall number of children whose parents are abroad, either mom or both mom and dad or just dad, 100,000 has some sort of psychological problem related to that. This is how we can track them down. So this is the price that people are paying for certain, con for certain condition of our economy. And when you see, when you take a look at the categories and at the numbers, what is especially significant to me is that those numbers don't change. We had a transformation in 1989 and for 15 or 20 years, things don't change. It's not really the, uh, of course, the low number of the indicator is important, but the fact that it, ha it is not improving is even more important. So when you look at the government consumption, it was at the level of five points, improving from, uh, curiously, from 1990 to 2000, they had better, uh, worse results than in the communist time. Well, but when you look at the year 2000 to the year 2014, it has not improved. It even deteriorated. When you looked at top marginal tax rate, it is improving only slightly, and the values are still not good. When you look at transfers and, and subsidies, again, the situation almost not changed since 2000. 
similar for legal system and property rights, judicial independence, impartial courts, protection of property rights. Especially the situation for courts is worrying because in 2000 they were already not impartial and in 2014 it's 3.93. It's a very poor result on a scale from 1 to 10. Uh, legal enforcement of contracts, reliability of police, all those values, they hover around five points, they are deteriorating. So this shows us that the state in itself is not evolving in a good direction. This, this tells us what are the conditions faced by people who have to start their economic activity. This is what they can count on if they if they have a disagreement either with their em employer or, or their employee or an investor. Freedom to trade internationally. Again, we have, uh, we have uh, severe capital controls, controls of the movement of people and non-tariff trade barriers. So all those things, they are influencing our economy. We don't see it on, on the surface of the things because we have one part of the indicator that is pulling the whole result up. But the small things that we can see here, they tell us more about the situation of the country. And here, when we look at the bureaucracy costs from 2000, when the value was at 7.13, in 2014, the value is 3.93. So over the 15 years it deteriorated. We are being told by the press the brilliant situation of Polish economy. Yes, but what is the situation of homo economicus in this economy? What are their chances of starting their own business? What are their chances of sustaining their own business? What are their chances of reaping the fruit of their effort? So 27 years since political transformation, everybody tells us that it takes time, that it has to be gradual, that there is a price we have to pay for political freedom. But I was thinking, especially in relation to yesterday, to the Veterans Day, which happens to be also the, uh, the, the day of independence in Poland, in the interwar period, Poles had barely 21 years to rebuild their country. And this is the picture from the emblem city of that period. Period. This is the picture of Gdynia. They had a plan that they will gain the access to the seaport. Gdynia was the only place where they could build it. And so they did. And Gdynia is the symbol of action that was taken together of plans that were coherent and that were aimed at improving the economic situation of Poland. So many years ago it took them 20 years to unite Poland torn after three partitions. The, of course the situation was not ideal but there was the spirit behind it. Was the, was the spirit behind 1989? I believe this is the spirit. <laughs> we, have, we have a group of people who are determined on pushing forward the changes no matter what the, the cost of it others. is to others. As long as the theory is sound, that's perfect. I, to prepare uh, my research, I was reading the books by uh, the professor who is pictured in this photograph who was describing how the changes were introduced uh, during the period of 1989-1992 and he was writing about how important a concern for him was to keep the inflation low and it's true we still have fabulous low inflation but we also have almost two million young Poles abroad. Thank you. Don't worry, I want you
because you're too thin skinned. That's how it goes on in our office upstairs. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> then she complains to her husband. And I tell him to eat a cheeseburger before he could talk to me as well. Take me outside. Anyway, thank you very much. This is exactly the gist. Uh, at what cost do we reform? Policies that nobody would dare to implement in the United States because we would carry politicians out on pitchforks were implemented in post-communist Poland with absolutely no remorse. Now we can argue whether or not shock therapy was the key to everything. Well, it's its a uh, consequence, one of its consequences, is that Poland has absolutely no strategic industries. And as much as in California, I understand the concerns about rare earths, because the United States used to have a monopoly in the 70s. And then greedy unions, greedy capitalists, and stupid environmentalists conspired to close all the rare earth mines so now China has a monopoly in it, and it can blackmail Japan and us. Fortunately, we here at IWP and a few other people worked a few years ago on that problem, and we now have resurrected a little bit of our rare earth capacity, because not everything is market. Some of it is sheer survival as a national security. So one, uh, one um, consequence of shock therapy was that um, the, the Poland is devoid of strategic industries. Another one, its banking system is almost absolutely out of Polish hands. The strategic decisions for investment are not made by people who are invested in the nation. And the third one is the young people got kicked out. And guess what? Before the last parliamentary election, a pundit, a leftist pundit, went on TV. He said, "The Polish, uh, the Polish, especially the young, are too radical. They're too patriotic. They're too nationalist. We have to kick them out." Now this is 25 years later on, so it was last year. See, certain things don't change. You see, hardship means the ones who are able to stand up and say. I'm going to beat you into a pulp, you call me. You make sure they leave, and they don't rebel. And there is a, at least since 2004, there is a venue called the EU. So Poland's post-communist elite simply got rid of the young people. They imported misery, and those people do well for themselves in England and elsewhere, much better than they would have had they stayed in Poland. So there is no surprise there. At the same time, they become abroad in England, even more nationalist, even more radicalized. So if a consequence of the Brexit will be that um, the foreigners will be uh, <coughs> ejected, those, those people, ladies and gentlemen, Young people will come back to Poland very angry. And the current government will look like a lib, limpy, lefty outfit. For they are very, very radical. And the post-communist elite wanted to get rid of misery. They wanted, they wanted to have a shock therapy, but only on one level property transfer, enriching oneself. Imagine three million unemployed communist secret policemen and their students. I wouldn't cry. I'd give them one-way tickets to Moscow. But three million or two and a half million, or whatever it is, of young people getting kicked out, that's a crime. Thank you, Maria, for bringing it up. Thank you. And now it's my open question. <laughs> Yes. Can you bring the uh, PowerPoint back on with um, some of those um, <laughs> ratings? There's one there that stuck out. Um, t 
just a second. Uh, is it this one? <laughs> Which one? Mm -hmm. Why are capital controls? Do you know why capital controls are so bad? Does anyone know? Because that's pretty bad. Uh, frankly speaking, <coughs> I'm not an economist. <laughs> And, and I, I would be very happy if, uh, if any person who is uh, trained in economy better than I am uh, could join me. Maybe we could write a paper which would be um, longer or maybe we could even write a book about it. But I believe that what we would have to do is to contact uh, Fraser Institute and ask because they have the access to the data. Yes? <laughs> the gentleman and then the lady, I'm sorry. Uh, for those of our history than then the contemporary period, could you give about a two minute description of what the shock therapy specifically involved? Uh, basically, the, si the situation uh, looked like that. We had a political transformation in the 1989. And um, Dr. Hodakiewicz always gives an example uh, of a piece of card. If you take a, a piece of paper and you do this, it's not, not, it's not something new, yeah? It's just a piece of paper which has been crumbled, but the nature of it doesn't change. So this is what was done in Poland. We had no privatization. Uh, the property that was stolen from the families that used to have it before the war was not given back to those people. Nobody was asking whether nationalization of certain companies uh, was legal or not. This was not the question at all. The question was how do we trans transfer from the state-owned property to the private property and uh, it's hard for me to say how many people uh, got rich, whether it was 90% of nomenclatura of, or 80% of nomenclatura, but certainly none of the people responsible for introduction of very radical reforms that, led million, that left millions of people destitute due to the financial decisions that were taken and due to the uh, radical economic decisions that were taken. Uh, none of those responsible for the decisions is poor nowadays. So in essence this was it. They figured out a way how to enrich themselves through political transformation without really taking care of 38 million Polish people who also had the right to partake in the uh, privatization of the national property. So, so you could sum it up as, as crony capitalism or rent yep. the yeah. yeah, it, it was, uh, there are theories um, that um, in the 1980s the Soviet Union knew that it's economically inviable so that they were preparing the peaceful transition into a different system. And Poland might have been one of the variants. What I would like to point out is that Poland is the only country among the post-Soviet countries that was not um, vetted. We had no systematic lustration. Up until now, we, have not, we had no systematic lustration. So as a result, we have never had a period without communist influence. For instance, uh, in Germany or in Czech Republic, uh, the former communists were banned from public offices for 10 years. In Poland, this has never happened. And as a result, they lost temporarily political power because they were just getting tremendously rich tremendously quickly. Yes? Um, so, Professor Witold Kierzyn, 
Her zoom he is from the classes. Yes, he's from the book in the place. Her zoom, not her zoom. He's not from Western Poland. He's one of us, not one of you guys. He doesn't care to be very precise. He's 96 years old. Yes. In his book, Catalonia Transformatis, it's an incredible book, very difficult for me as a medical doctor to understand, but it's very well written. He also has quite a few YouTube interviews. If you just Google um, Google Pal. Okay, so he talks about um, the Pathologia Transformatis as a process of neocolonization, neocolonization policy. Okay, where mm -hmm. Poland becomes a neocolony, where 97% of the Polish banking system is in foreign hands, where most of the uh, private enterprises and so on are owned by foreigners. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, I am focusing on the on the problem from a bit different perspective uh, because uh, we tend to look at the situation of of economy in terms of the overall picture. We look at GDP, we look at the performance of economy, and we say, "Oh, Polish economy is great," and nobody is asking those simple questions. Yes, the economy is great, but is it great for the Poles? Or is it just great? And, and I think that looking into the nature of Polish immigration is important because it points to a phenomenon uh, which I would call a glass ceiling. If you are ambitious, uh, if you want to achieve, if you want to start your own company, in Poland, it takes so much time that people establish their companies in the UK and they conduct their economic oh. activity oh. Uh, in Poland. So this is one level that it's very difficult to start your uh, to start your business. But to sustain it, it's also difficult, and sometimes the reasons for it are totally unmeritorial. For instance, you may be familiar with the, with the life story of uh, Roman Kluska, the man who, who was uh, starting a very successful computer business in Poland at the beginning of the 1990s. He was violently intimidated into stopping his business activity. His competition got a huge, huge government uh, order for computerization of all state administration and he got kicked out he is growing sheep somewhere on the polish border raising sheep um, the competition was uh, gru <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, and they came to him in both a paragraph from um, a paragraph from martial law which is still on the books because the polish parliament didn't get around to fixing it and they militarized all his vehicles and froze his accounts. And they vetted him for two years, so his business collapsed. And they said, oh, we found no irregularity. This is an underground guy, a guy who was in fighting solidarity, <coughs> fighting the communists. And all he wanted to do was put computers together, you know, and sell them. And he was very successful. However, he made a mistake. He made a million dollars. That's when. GRU, military intelligence services, came to him and said, yo, cough up. And he said, no, I'm not going to uh, corrupt anybody, and I oppose corruption. So that's what happened. Right? And that's it in, in post-communism, day in and day out. It's even worse in Russia. In Moldova, it's abysmal, and it's that in Tajikistan, it's unbelievable. But the mechanisms are very similar everywhere. Uh, you, you might also have heard about Ryszard Kolczyk. But his his father was connected to to Polish communist secret service. So when you have uh, when you have people active in economy and then their kids are active in economy, there's no way you can compete. Uh, you know, in the 1990s, people in Poland used to say the first million you have to steal. So if you want, if you don't want to there steal was, your first million, Prime Minister Mazowiecki, this is a quote from Poland's <coughs> first non-communist prime minister. This is a quote. Quote: 
So, so the, the moment we had an opportunity to try to realize our dreams without having to enter the system, we did it. And this is what we see, 1.8 million people abroad in a Poland that is supposedly in flourishing condition. And, and I, I think it's very important to talk about it here in America because this is perpetuated by American press. Everyone says, how come the new government uh, is new? Why didn't they like the previous one? Poland is flourishing. If you approach the analysis of reality with some sort of thesis in your head, you will never discover why this is happening. Because uh, here at IWP, and I will maybe sing our praises, we, uh, we are focusing on logocentrism. We want to check facts and then we, we make conclusions. If you have a conclusion before you even start to investigate, all you can write is that, oh yeah, the situation is blur brilliant, never mind 5% of the population. Yes? Yeah, also um, one of those charts you had also showed that the administrative costs, I think, of running a business are incredibly high in Poland. And uh, the, I mean, I, I have another story where my buddy tried starting an import company of importing fancy teas from the Orient or somewhere out there. And the hygiene control in Poland shows up and pretty much they want a bribe because he'd be in competition with a bigger company. <laughs> and uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's, um, it's not a company in front of company. Also, the labor market, one of those stats do show that labor market in Poland are horrendous. Everyone I talk to says the same thing. Yes, the last question. Um, how, much is this, how much is the EU responsible for this? Because there's a lot of regulations. Like, let's say something as silly as you have a farm, you can't sell your milk, you can't have, sell your eggs without registering, uh, etc. I, be, I believe that there, uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say because we have some sort of post-Soviet load of, of very rigid structure and the European Union is just another structure juxtaposed on it. So it's really hard to stipulate. Um, I think I will have to give the floor to our last speaker. I will be very happy to ask Professor Hodakiewicz to introduce uh, Piotr, who is also with Kościuszkocze. And uh, please, Let's clap to our last speaker. <laughs>